Goodwin. Thank you for being with us for History's Lunch today. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. History's Lunch is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackelford Charitable Fund for the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're here in our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. And if you've not already done so, please silence your cell phones. Make plans to join us here in the auditorium on Thursday, August 12th at 6 p.m. for a program with Dr. Hilliard Lackey and Dr. Sade Turnipseed examining sharecropping in Mississippi. If you can't make it in person, we'll also live stream that program. You can find details on the Museum of Mississippi History Facebook page. And then I hope you'll join us for History's Lunch next week when Christian Pennon and Charles Weeks will discuss their new book, Colonial Mississippi, A Borrowed Land. That's the new volume in the Heritage of Mississippi series. And uh, we are grateful to them, uh, since they were originally scheduled for this date, for swapping with us when there were some logistical issues. But those logistical issues paid off, and today we are delighted to welcome Bobby Rush and Brenda Willis. Bobby Rush is a Grammy award-winning blues musician who has recorded more than 400 songs over the course of five decades in the music industry. He is a Blues Hall of Famer, a 13-time Blues Music Award winner, and a B.B. King Entertainer of the Year, known as the King of the Chitlin' Circuit. He'd not been picked. He'd just been picked by the right hand. I ain't studying you as his first book. Brenda Fuller Willis is a writer for the Jackson Advocate newspaper and an expert on blues and African-American foodways. She holds a Master's of Education in Vocational Rehabilitation Counseling from Mississippi State University and a Doctorate in Theology from New Foundation Theological Seminary. Willis is the CEO of Twice as Nice Entertainment LLC. Help me welcome Bobby Rush and Brenda Willis. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm glad that you all could make it. I am Brenda Willis and I wanted to start things off with uh, an article. We have a paper in your seat from the Jackson Advocate, an article that I wrote on Bobby a few week, uh, months ago. And my question was, is Bobby the last rabbit foot minstrel? And I think he is. And so I wrote the article and I wanted to explore a little bit about um, the rabbit foot I had gone to a, I'm going to sit for a minute if you don't mind. Uh, I had gone to a exhibit at the Crossroads Cultural Center in Port Gibson, and they had a rabbit foot minstrel exhibit going on at the time, and Bobby was featured, of course, and that kind of sparked me to think, well, mm, Bobby's act and show looks a lot like the minstrels. And so I talked to a few people and then I got a chance to actually interview Bobby and that was when he actually solidified for me that he truly is the last rabbit foot minstrel. Um, the minstrel shows were started back in the 1800s. Uh, your, the, the copy of the article is the back uh, page of the newspaper and it's the inside back uh, story. That story uh, evolved and after I had done the interview with Bobby, that's when I decided I would write the story. Um, the 1800s was a time when black people were still uh, enslaved, uh, but there were people who were taking advantage of the black culture. And the whites that were taking uh, advantage of the culture uh, would perform, of course, in blackface, and they were very successful at it. Uh, there was a guy named Pat Chappelle in Florida who decided then if white people are making money off of our culture, then we should too. Uh, a lot of uh, academicians uh, of more modern times saw the minstrels as buffoons, but the black people had to make a living, and lot, a lot of them did not want to continue uh, slaving away in the cotton fields. They didn't want to drive a tractor for $3 a day or sometimes $3 a week. And so they decided then that they would make their own shows. Pat Chappelle had one of the uh, first uh, all-black uh, minstrel shows. He did everything from managing, from 
uh, picking the talent. And in picking the talent, of course, then they had to appeal to white audiences also. And you will see in the story that some of the black uh, minstrels did perform in blackface. Uh, some of the white performers performed in blackface. They would take shoe polish, things, uh, coal, different things to uh, color the skin, uh, but they were very successful. And there's a guy that is known as the father of the minstrelsy, and that was Daddy Rice. And in 1900s, um, he was in Port Gibson. Dave Chappelle, not Dave Chappelle, Pat Chappelle, um, was able to sell his show to Daddy Rice. And once he sold that show, then they kind of disappeared from the landscape. Vaudeville was coming in at that time, and so he decided that it would be best to sell the show. Uh, the show became very famous in Port Gibson. There is a rabbit foot uh, trail marker in Port Gibson. And if you're ever in the area, you'll see that uh, Bobby is mentioned on that um, trail marker. And in doing so, I was looking and more curious when I interviewed Bobby about, well, how did he come about having the type of show? How many of you have seen a Bobby Rush show? Okay, he didn't bring the girls today. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, I was curious as to how he developed his show. Bobby's told me during the interview that he was 13, 14 years old when he ran off from uh, Louisiana to Arkansas, and that's how he ended up in the minstrel shows. He said um, one of the guys that was running the show asked him, he was kind of a, a, a gopher at that point for some of the other uh, bigger names that were in the minstrel shows. Uh, but one day they asked him, well, what do you know how to do? And Bobby told him, well, I know how to do the ham bone. I know how to play guitar a little bit. And so he started, and he was making money, more money than he had ever made before. And so he ended up then picking up different things from those minstrel shows that he was watching as a kid. And then he decided, well, I'll incorporate some of those things into my show. And as he uh, grew up, moved to Chicago, and he was looking at the muddy waters and uh, the buddy guys of the uh, era. And so he was incorporating everything that he had learned down south, he had taken it north. And so some of the things that were in the south were not in the north. And even though the muddy waters and people like that were playing clubs and everything, they didn't have the complete act. And so Bobby took a lot of those things from the acts that he had seen as a child and incorporated it. And he added a little here and added a little there. Now, one of the things with the uh, early minstrel shows was the fact that they had chorus line girls. And the <coughs> chorus line girls at the time had to pass what they call the brown paper bag test, and that meant that their skin tone could be no darker than a brown paper bag. And so the girls were a part of the show, but you could have some of everything, jugglers, you could have comedians, you could have tap dancers. The minstrel shows had a little bit of everything. And so if you've ever seen a Bobby Rush show, you'll see a present day Bobby Rush show, you'll see that he incorporates a lot of that into the show. He does a, a skit where he puts on the uh, Michael Jackson glove and jacket, and he does a little routine there. He also does a routine uh, with Elvis where he puts on the sideburns and the sunglasses and uh, he knows how to, you know, to do the Elvis shake. And so there are different things that he incorporated and which has made his show stand out from others that you see. You can go to blue shows and you'll see a lot of different people doing a lot of things, but you won't see anybody doing Bobby Rush. There's only one Bobby Rush. 
And it doesn't matter if you are a big blues fan or if you're not a blues fan. When you go to a Bobby Rush show, you're going to see a little bit of blues. You're going to see a little bit of funk. And you'll even see a little bit of rap because as Bobby tells it, uh, he and James Brown invented some of the things that you see these big rap stars doing now. They were doing back in the day. And so... A minstrel show has a lot of different aspects, a lot of cultural uh, differences that are illuminated. And a lot of times our culture is often copied, but uh, people not necessarily wanting us to be seen. Bobby tells a story in the book, uh, I Ain't Studying You, My American Blues Story, about how he went to Blue Island in Illinois and the audience wanted to hear him, but they didn't want to see him. They had him behind a curtain. And so, you know, that's kind of how things evolve. Bobby is 86 years old now, and he'll be 87 uh, November 10th. <laughs> but if you... <laughs> But if you've ever seen a Bobby Rush show, you won't think he's 86 years old because he gets around a lot better than I do. Uh, but when you're at a Bobby Rush show, you're going to hear a variety of music. And it's all centered in the blues, but he's added a few other nuances that will make it a little bit different. And that's what sets him aside then from a lot of the other artists that you'll see uh, at different blues shows and festivals throughout the country. And uh, what I'd like to do is to go ahead and start um, a quick interview here with Bobby and talk a little bit, but I really want you as the audience to ask the questions that you'd like to have answers to. And at the end, we're going to have, hopefully, Bobby will play a little bit of something for us. We're going to sell the books on this side. Uh, they've been signed, but Bobby's going to be over on this side, and he may personalize your copy that you've purchased. Okay, we're going to start out with uh, a little bit about the book. Bobby wrote the book with Herb Powell. He is uh, one of the, uh, the co-writer. Uh, Bobby basically told him the stories that uh, are centered in the book. The book is also dedicated to Bobby's children. Bobby has uh, children that have passed away and he dedicated the book to them. In the book he tells different stories uh, from different periods throughout his life and in doing so it was enough to compile this book and there's probably another one on the way <laughs> because I'm sure over the course of his career uh, Bobby's been in the business now for decades and I'm sure there are lots of other things that are not in this book that will be in the other uh, in the next book uh, some of you may have seen Bobby in uh, what I think it's the Dolomite Kid it's the movie and one thing that was very funny when I talked to Bobby uh, doing the interview, he was telling me about the movie. And I said, well, you know, you appeared as Bobby Rush. Did you have, did they write out a script for you? He said, yeah, they wrote out a script, but I don't need a script to play Bobby Rush. <laughs> I was like, yeah, now that makes sense. So you'll be able to see Bobby in other movies about the blues. Uh, you can go on the internet, of course, and find out lots of information. <coughs> but today, you're going to hear it straight from the horse's mouth. Uh, I present to you, Mr. Bobby Rush, I Ain't Studying You, Thank My you. American Blues Story. Thanks so much. Let me just stand, since I can. <laughs> I was born in a little place called Homer Haynes, Louisiana. Most of you never heard this. My great grandfather and grandmother was right here, Jackson, around the Jackson area. My great great granddaddy named Van Spivey, who he had six kids by his wife and five by my great grandma, who was a white man. My mother is blonde, hair, and blue eyes. 
my mother, she was babysitting me when we was in the public. She was my mama at night when I got home. My daddy was her sh chauffeur when we was in the streets, what have you. She was a husband and my father when we was at home. I never talked about this openly. I left in 1947 from Louisiana and went to Pine Bluff, Arkansas. On my way back to Mississippi to find my roots, although I went to Chicago and stayed 48 years in Chicago, still thinking about my roots, because I was told not to never come back to Mississippi because we were looking for someone to harm us. But when we found out that our great granddad was trying to divide land here in Mississippi to his children, and my great grandmama was one of the kids, half brothers to the white side of the family. So the white side of the family took my great grandmama to Eudora, Arkansas. They raised themselves in a bun. That's how my dad met my mom. This has been hard for me to talk about because my mother was my mother who loved me and protected me and my father because they would have killed my father from being with my mom. Cause my mom is blue eyed and blonde hair. I tell it in this book. Took me 40 years to talk about that. I'm back in Mississippi, the only great grandson to move back. I was gonna leave Arkansas and go to Chicago where I could be free to do what I want to do as a black man, as a musician. That was my heaven, I thought. I didn't have enough money to buy myself a ticket from Pine Bluff to Chicago. So I bought a ticket from Pine Bluff, Arkansas to Memphis, Tennessee, where B.B. King, Sonny Boy Williams. I worked on Bill Street for two and three dollars a day. Got enough money to go where Chuck Berry was in St. Louis. Him, Red Fox, was in St. Louis and Albert King, living in Love, Joe, Illinois. I got enough money of that to go to Chicago where Muddy Water was waiting on me. He and Howlin' Wolf, Johnny Hooker, Jimmy Reed, Bo Dilly, people like that. So when I got to Chicago, Ms. Willis would tell you about, then I, J. Bill Illinois said, I got a place you can make $7 a night, man, for you and the band. $7 a night, me and the four-piece band. They said, Muddy Water would do your work on a Wednesday night for you. I said, how much you want, Muddy Water? He said, give me $5.50, I'll work for you on Wednesday night. I paid Muddy Water $5.50, 1951. But I went to this place to work behind a curtain where it was a white audience, where they wanted to hear my music, didn't want to see my face. I was out of brick wall, didn't know what to do. So I went down to Leonard, Chess, Phil Chess, the Chess Brothers, to get a job. Bo Dilly was sitting across and Act Turner and all the guys looking, trying to get a job at Chess. And I made a mistake. Farina Pampa said, 10 and 208, the union was, union was journeying. That was one union, but now they journeying because this union was split. One side of the union represented the black musician, one side of the same union represented representing the white musician. But now they journeyed. I thought that was a good thing. I said, man, just good. So Bo Dilly and a few guys laughed at me. I didn't know anything about the trick or the trade of a, the white and black issue of it. So I just read it. So Phil walked out and said, what did that boy say? He said, the union is journey. He said, where you get the information from? He's off your desk. So he got the paper and threw it back to him. He said, read that boy talking about me. And I read it to him. He turned to his brother and said, we can't use that nigga because he can read. I didn't get the job. Muddy Waters, Lightning the Slim, they all got the job. I got thrown out the building. Then I went down on Rush Street to get a job myself. Dick Gregory. One, he was the first black man to hire the Playboy, so he got me a job at the Playboy, 1952. Then I left that and went down on Rush Street to work at Bourbon Street, 
on the door, it said, no color allowed. I took three white guys and went in and auditioned, knowing I had a black band. The man said, yeah, this is going to be good. We're going to integrate this place. Well, a dumb country boy like me, I never heard the word integrate. I was wanting to get out and go find a dictionary, find out what that was. What is integrate? Well, I didn't know what it was and then studied about it. And I said, well, I got this black band, three-piece band. I brought them down on Wednesday night. They had one band playing 30 minutes, another band playing, no, it was one album, one album off. So I've come down about 10, about 10 minutes to 9, I'm supposed to start at 9 o'clock. This guy called Kunch was running the place. When I walked up, Kunch, Chinese guy, was running the place. He said, where's the band? I said, right here with me, three black guys. He said, oh, no, you can't do that. We can't integrate this place. He said, but come on in. You, you, got, you got to call them little guys you did the audition with. Come on in. We, the white band playing, we couldn't dress with the white band. I couldn't sit with the white band. So they got a cloak room. So we sit in the cloak room. They put a change on the door. So if we wanted to go to the bathroom, it was three knock. If the one still the bathroom, if the number two, you drop four knocks, if you know what I mean. <laughs> if you wanted some food, it was five knocks, and they brought you food, hot dogs or what have you. So then we went to work, there was a lady, we were playing in a pit. There was a lady, said, Barbara Rush, I heard what they said about you. We're going to integrate this place. That's the third time I heard integrate. So what is integrate? Well, I was a young man. I thought I was pretty good looking. I thought it was they going to set me in a room with a bunch of ladies and make, you know, you know, like make babies or what, make good slaves. I said, I can make a good integrator. That's what I thought, you know. I didn't, I didn't know what integrate was. But I said that to let you know that I want to write this book. I'm talking kind of fast going forward with what was on my mind. I've been wanting to write this book a long time. But I knew I was going to hurt somebody's feeling by some truth in this, in this book. Because now I'm talking about a friend, Willie Dixon, who wrote songs for Muddy Water and Howlin' Wolf and all them people. Now you're going to find out he really didn't write the song. They know it didn't. I'm telling you now. Because I was paid a lot of hush money not to send them about the Cadillac Records. Because I know the real deal. Myself, but a guy know the real deal. How are Willie Dixon going to write for someone who can't read or write? Now his grandkids going to come at me. But what about Mother Waters' kid and all the other people here? What about all the other children? What about a Bobby Rush? With all the songs that I had, I had 397 records. And some of the stuff that I wrote, somebody had taken it from me. Somebody had taken it from me. But I'm going forward kind of fast with it, letting you know how I was protected. I was protected but with this guy that I went to work at Bourbon Street. And we'll get back on that. Because I found out, later told me, he said, Bobby Rush, tonight we're going to integrate this place. This is the fourth time I heard this integrate thing. She said, I'm going to get sick. They, every girl advanced 15 minutes apiece. Five, four girls, which is one hour. Then we off to another break. She said, oh, my stomach. Come up on the stage. I got up on the stage, all white audience, and the ditch of Chuck Berry, did it, did it, did it. And, it, and this big fat guy was sitting on the corner. He laughed. I said, man, I got one fan if I don't have nobody else. <laughs> About 2 o'clock that night, somebody said, Bobby Rush, through the loudspeaker. speaker, Bobby Rush, come to the office. I didn't know where the office was. So I went back to the bar. I said, listen, I said, I spoke to meet the boss man back in the office. He said, oh, yeah, he's right here. I went behind the bar, went to the office. So when I got back to the office, this same guy was sitting over there laughing at me in the audience. He was sitting there smoking a cigar. Look around, he said, hey, boy, <laughs> you integrating my damn place. He spoke. Hey, <laughs> you got nerve, boy, to come in here and integrate my place. What kind of stuff is this? I can't say what he really said. 
He said, sit down, boy. I sit down. He said, hey, <laughs> you know what, boy? You got to know if we're going to make a lot of money, boy. Ain't that right? I said, depending on what I got to do. He said, what you got to do, you do what the hell I tell you to do. I didn't know who he was. So I was, had put my age up. I was nice. 20 years old, get ready to buy me a house. I needed $1,200, didn't have an 800. Do my closing call. So he said, if you ever need anything, boy, here's my card. He called country. Country, this is my boy, okay? Bobby Rush is my boy. I pay him, okay? You pay Sammy David Jr., but, he, but he's my boy. You know me, Sammy David Jr., working at the club. You know, I'm, you know, I'm opening the show for him. I'm pretty big boy. So the lady said, you know who you're working for? I said, no, not really. He said, look at that card. So I looked at the card, and I went by trying to get the, took me three weeks to get the money up for, the, for my closing calls, trying to find $400. Wasn't making but $7.50 a night. My wife said, what about the guy you work for? Can you, you think you can borrow the money from him? I said, yeah. What, what shirt did I have on? She said, you had that plaid shirt on. I washed it a couple of days ago. We goes back in the washer, get the card out. It was all wrinkled up. We, me and her got the iron, me and my wife ironed it out. And so we could see the letters on. We took it down to my lawyer. I said, listen, man, lawyer Tate, black lawyer. I said, man, I can get this house now. This man will let us have the money. He said, he, I put the card on. I said, this man. He said, get out here with that card. Don't come back in here. You are that card. And I didn't know who it was. On the card, it was Cesar Capone, Al Capone brother. I didn't know what I had. So now I'm going to, I have all these masters. Three years ago, if you Google me, I had the box set of the year. How you had a box set of the year if you don't own the masters? This cost, I didn't know Al Capone. The book gonna tell them they thought I knew him all these years. I didn't know nothing about it. I just know I was working for his brother. So when I walk into chess with Leonard Chess, Muddy Warden all be sitting out, I'll be I have my little record, I go in there and cut my little record, come out and put it on my arm like that. So you gonna pay today, Barbara Race? I said, I don't know, depending on what my boss say. They let me go. No, but they won't like a pong boy, let him go. <laughs> you got me? That's how I bluffed my way through for 48 years. Yeah. Yeah. But, that, but that wasn't a lie, that's how I bluffed my way But I lied before that time. I told the truth in the book. <laughs> one other, everything else in this book is, well, I saw say everything about it is true, but one thing in the book not true. But I said I wouldn't sleep with a fat woman or more. I lied about that. <laughs> I lied. <laughs> I lied about that. But I just want to tell you a little, little something about, about, that's a little something about me. When you read this book, I want you to go away saying, out of all the hills and valleys that I've been through, Diane, oh, oh God, all the things that happened to me, if I made it out of that, you can too. I haven't, I haven't been all, I haven't been all perfect. Haven't did everything just right. I had a beer in 1957. Never drank, smoked, get high, no form of fashion. Been involved with a lot of things. I tell it in the book because I've been jiving all the time. People thought I know Al Capone. Didn't know nothing about it. Had never saw him. You know, guys. Bobby Rush, you, you got any money? No, man. My boss will take care of it. Al Capone will take care of it. Didn't even know the man. Didn't, didn't have no, that's, I just know of him, you know. But those are some of the things that I bluffed my way through. Now, but now since I'm an entertainer, I don't bluff my way through on the bandstand. I used to not say what I'm getting ready to say now because it seemed like a pat on the back, but I'm, but I'm old enough now to know I'm good at what I do. Yeah, I'm good at it. And I'm, I'm so thankful, I'm so blessed that ain't many people who have gotten to the place I am now. 
I couldn't talk about this many years ago, but I'm like Martin Luther King. I've been to the mountaintop now. Ain't much you can do to me now. So I'm telling some things I may wouldn't have told long ago. But I'm here. How many men you know have crossed over? Now, I have a white audience and a black audience, but I never crossed over and crossed out. It's a, li it's a many people like myself in the age bracket of myself, black men as I'm talking about now, have crossed over and crossed out. Started off as the chilling circuit and crossed out. But I'm known as the king of the chilling circuit. I don't know whether you notice or not that I don't have no rings, no nothing on, I got no scratch, or nothing. I drive old, old pickup truck, whatever. You follow me? But God have blessed me, be smart enough to know that I don't know anything. Because when a man tell what he know, he won't talk long. Because man don't know nothing. And I'm, you know, and I just thank y'all for just listening to me. It ain't time to do no song, but someone asked me, I'm a comedian. Can y'all tell in my record that I'm a stand-up comedian? <laughs> <laughs> this same guy fell in love with my personality of what I'm doing. I told this same guy, not knowing that he was related to Al Capone. I said, Caesar, I'm going to get a job down the street at the uh, swing club. He said, okay, boy, when you're leaving. I said, I'm going to give you a two-week notice. Hey, fine kid, you're a fine kid. So I gave him a two-week notice and went down the street. Well, he was paying me $7. Now I'm getting $11 a night. Big boy now. $11 a night. Then when I got ready to get my paycheck after working three, four days, I said, well, I'm where I get my paycheck from? Who paid me? The guy told me to hide by. He said, right up the street, just out the door, two doors up, upstairs. Well, hell, that's the same place I've been getting. <laughs> so I went back up there. He walked here the same. <laughs> You're back, boy. I said, yes, sir. He said, I like you. You get anything I want. You respectable. That's how I got in got in the door. He said, I'm going to send you to Walden's Corner, my big brother. He want a comedian. He paid you $15 a night. $15 a night, a lot of money. He said, now, he don't lag, but you make him laugh. So I went by his place, 12 o'clock in the daytime. Nobody ever me and him with his fat self. Me and him, he said, country said you could make me laugh. Throw the chin like that. Got a little beard. He said, nothing funny to me, boy. Make me laugh. I said, I can make you laugh. He said, what? Make me laugh, then. As I went by this girl's house the other night, about 8.30, she didn't get home to about 8.45. He looked at me and said, how'd you get in the house? I said, she left the door open. And I hid, when she walked in the door, I hid behind the door. He looked at me, I said, when she walked up, she didn't know I was in there. I just said, stick that out, I said, boo. She said, oh, you almost scared my panties off. I said, boo, boo, boo. <laughs> and he laughed. He laughed. I, I honestly, I got the job. <laughs> then I got the job. That wasn't too funny, but I made him laugh. <laughs> but here's what I want to say to you. Well, then we're going to get into the book. It's so many things. I can't tell everything in here. You'll find out in 1963 where myself and Ike Turner, there were 10 trucks. I had a real short story. 10 trucks. One truck hit my station wagon, flipped it over. Myself and Robert Plunkett was in there. Act Turner was in the front of that. He flipped it, the car over. Another truck hit that truck until 10 trucks hit each other. All 10 trucks and 10 men got burned up. Myself and the drummer was the only survivor. And when I dug a hole in the ground because it was zero degree, tried to stay warm till someone found me. Someone did find me. I don't know who it was, what the sheriff officer, the police officer, just a bunch of people. I don't know who it was. I heard somebody say, is anybody else here? Say, everybody there, just two niggas. They're in the ground. They're already buried. Leave them, leave them there. And they left us there. 
And that's how I got involved with Martin Luther King. So when you get in there, that's how I got involved with Martin Luther King. This Coretta who came to my rescue and tried to help me, help my, help me out of that mentally. So I've been through a lot of things, been through a lot of things. Uh, married twice. Uh, my first wife, I got married when I was 18 years old. We had three children. She had three, my sister-in-law, it was three of them, and they thought they were my children. They thought that was our their dad because I was their brother-in-law. Because when we got married, they was five, six, and seven years old. So I taken her children in. After my third child was born, 18, 19 months old, Sherry, she passed. Then I had a daughter who was 19 years old, she passed. Then my two sister-in-law, which were my children, they passed. Then my mother-in-law and father-in-law passed the same year. The next year, my other child passed. The next year, my wife passed. That was all of my family. So I picked up my guitar and looked up from where I come, from my health come from and grabbed the hope from wherever. And I survived the rat race. It's been tough on me, double tough as a blues singer and as a black man, as a blues singer. And having a knowledge of what people was trying to do to me before they did it to me was another burden. Because I, if I hadn't knew what they was trying to do, it wouldn't have hurt me as bad, I don't think. So someone said, well, why are you saying the blues? Is it because your woman left you? Yes. But you can also have the blues, fellas, if they stay too long. <laughs> Let me show you what I mean. <laughs> Have you ever been mistreated? By someone you showed up little. been mistreated by someone you should have loved. Out of all of me and my woman could have left me far. She left me for the garbage man. No matter how bad she treated me, still can't get it out of my mind. No matter how bad you treated me, still can't get it out of my mind. Every time I see a garbage can, I think about her and the garbage man all the time. If I ever get my woman to come back home, I'm gonna buy myself a garbage truck. If they ever get my woman to come back home, I'll buy myself a garbage truck. And when my garbage can't get full, I'm gonna take it and dump it way, way out in the woods. That's the blues fight. You know, I just appreciate you all so much. You don't know how it made me feel to see you show up and I see your eyes looking at me like you love me, and if you don't, you respect me. We love you, Bobby. I love you, Bobby. <laughs> and, I, and I'm looking at young people who probably said, well, I don't like no blues singer. 
you young, you, you, you probably like old Snoop Dogg now. <laughs> I, listen, ain't nothing wrong with Snoop Dogg now. I'm not talking about just nothing wrong because Snoop Dogg and them stole all that stuff from me anyway. <laughs> In fact, if it wasn't for me, it wouldn't be no 50 cent, be a dime, a quarter, something like that. <laughs> you know? But it rapids. Italy shack down by the bay, not far from New Orleans. I met this pretty woman down there when I was about 19. She went and told her daddy she wanted to marry me. And the look on her face, you know, really was a sight to see. He said, get out of here with you. And don't you come back no more. Well, I thought I wanted to meet her daddy like a young man ought to. But he didn't want no blues singer like Bobby Ray to get married to his daughter. I went by the house that night. Guess who walked through the door? Dad, mom, big brother John, damn dog named Bo, saying, get out of here with you, and don't you come back no more. <laughs> Kids around there, sick the dogs on me. You know what they did? Tore off all my clothes. I was running real fast, trying to get away all down that dusty road. I was running fast, trying to get away, and I crossed the railroad track. I could hear the kids throwing rocks at me every time. I stopped to look back, saying, get out of here with you. And don't you come back no more. <laughs> get out of here with you. And don't you come back no more. Well, I sneak down to get married, y'all. And the judge says, you decide to swear? You take that woman for your lawful wife and not a one-night love affair. Before I could open my mouth to say I do, guess who walked through the door? Dad, Mom, Bet, and John, and that dog named Bo. Saying, get out of here with you. And don't you come back no more. What I thought right then, if I wanted to get married anyway, I had to find a way to elope. I decided to go to Las Vegas to get away from her nosy folks. As soon as I got to Las Vegas, you know what? That same day I walked in, got all her kin, all her friends, and that big damn dog again. <laughs> Saying, get out of here. Which, see, that, that's, that's, I'm a rapper. <laughs> but but I'll tell you one thing. When you, when you, when you get, I talked to a gentleman, he's, they, they, they ain't, they're not old, but they're getting up there, you know. When you get that old, try to remember all that stuff. That's hard to do, too. <laughs> that's hard to do. I just want to thank you. So we're going to get some questions and answers. You already did that, so I don't know. I can't, I can't talk about all, everything I got in this book. I can't talk about everything. But I, did, I do want to tell you that I want to thank all the proprietors and all the people. I want to thank my sister's twins for doing this for me. I have been so blessed. My dad had been a preacher <clears throat> and a pastor of a church, my best friend and my father. He told me when I was about 10 or 12, 10, 11 years old, I'm named after my father, Emmett Ellis Jr. I changed my name just because no other reason just because of my father, because of what he stood for as a minister, as a preacher. That's the only reason I changed my name to Bobby Rush. I wanted to change my name to Eidenhouse, <laughs> Roosevelt, something like that. That's all I knew, big names, you know. But Bobby Eidenhouse, how about that? <laughs> uh, Bobby Roosevelt, you know. You know. But, but, I, but I choose a name that's one syllable. You notice everybody called me Bobby Rush. Nobody called me Bobby. Nobody called me Rush. Everybody called me Bobby Rush. Ain't but one. A lot of Rush, a lot of Bobby. Ain't but one Bobby Rush. I'm watching the clock on me. What my daddy put in me, I had to remember a lot. Because I remember he told me to go to work at a gym out of 10 children. That's right. My, and my dad had 10 children. And his father, which was my grandfather, had 36 children. And my daddy had, my grandmama, had seven sets of twins back to back. Yeah, and then my father and my grandfather died at 108. He had 612 grandkids at his funeral. So it's a big family, you know. It's a big family. Yeah, that's, that's, a lot of, that's, that's a lot of whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I said that to let you know that how I got my, my knowledge from what my dad, I had to go in this job, get a job at the gym. 
He never told me what to do. He says, Junior? I said, yes, sir. He said, I want you to get a job at the gym. They won't pay you but $3 a week, but you can get so much information, boy, and bring it to me. That's all he had to say to me. He said, because the other boys, the other my kids wouldn't understand that. I didn't say why or what. My job was going to the gym for $3 a day when all the white guys was in the gym talking about the Dow Jones and the black folks didn't know what Dow Jones was. And I didn't either. What I'm, they were talking about what they're going to sell the cotton for, what they wasn't going to sell it for, the beans, the peas, whatever it was that they had to sell, they talked about it around the table. Well, I was a little boy, I had a rag in one pocket and sand in another pocket. I would throw it around the guy's feet and I would be on the table shining his shoes, brushing the dust off so I could hear the conversation. I get home, my daddy would like the Martin Luther King in the neighborhood, black church, he get all the black people around and say, Junior? I said, yes sir. He said, what you heard today? I said, you can't sell no peanuts, can't sell no popcorn, you can sell some cotton, but you can't sell no tomatoes, because the price go up and down. As long as people had it in the field, the price was down. When, the, when you didn't have it, the price went up in demand. And I would tell my dad, my dad if we had Sunday school, it was 9.30, he would get everybody around in the neighborhood at 9 o'clock, tell them what to sell, what not to sell for my information. <laughs> I was the newspaper. I was the newspaper. I was new, new, a newspaper. So uh, before I leave you, again, thank you, because we must find a way to find love between every person, not black and white issue. I know black and white matters, but life matters, but our vote matter most. We got to find a way to live together because you can't live without me and I can't live without you. We just can't do it and be successful at doing what we're trying to do. We just, we, we got to find a way. I'm saying that because I would have wrote something a little different about this book if I had waited for another year when I saw what happened in the White House. That let me know that everything have changed. Most of it still remain the same. It's almost like my toilets, my restroom. Cause when I was a boy, we didn't have no toilet inside the house. We had to go outside to a toilet. Now, right here in Jackson, Mississippi, where I live, I got nine bathrooms in my house. <laughs> they clean, they smell good, but guess what? What you do in them is the same. <laughs> that haven't changed. That haven't changed. So, so I beg you to go out and get your fascination shots and, and encourage others to do. I know that some don't believe in it, some don't, but I said to you, as a believer, when I sit down to eat, not knowing where the food come from, most of the time I don't know who fix it. I ask God to bless it so it won't harm my body and do, do my body good. So I don't know who fixed this shot and who do it and who's giving it, whether it's the doctor or the nurse or who have you. But I ask God to bless that too. And if anybody politically in the, in the house beside my brain, Bo, Y'all encourage the political folks to talk about this issue because we have an issue. I don't say you're right or wrong when I, all I know is something wrong. But we got to find a way to fix it. I'm talking about, and I, I don't believe in nothing will be fixed about this thing, but love between we as a people. We got to fix it. Because if we don't fix it, if you think it messed up now, just wait. Yes, sir. Just wait. Thank you so much. And I had, before I leave you, my plan is now at my age and time and, and what I have learned that I must do all I can while I can. When it comes a time I cannot do, I won't regret what I did not do. Got 10 minutes. We have a few minutes for questions. If anybody has a question, raise your hand. I'll bring the microphone to you.
Mr. Mr. Washington, answer. Well, no, no, this will be good for everybody can hear it online. It's not a question, but I see a guitar next to you. Yeah, How about uh, it? Can we hear it? Let me see. Can you hear it without... Yeah, maybe maybe we can make a way. Can y'all hear that? I'm gonna get a little closer. I'm broken, and disgusted. Lord, I'm lonely hearted too. I'm broken, disgusted, and I'm lonely, lonely, hearty too. I want you to take me to your house, little girl, so I can have a little talk with you. If I can't come in, let me sit down here by your door. If I can't come in, little girl, just let me sit down here by your door. I leave so early in the morning. Oh, Lord, your husband would never know. If I can't be your big dog, mama, let me be a little dog to your big dog come home. If I can't be your big dog, baby, let me be a little dog to your big dog come home. And I will show you, little girl, how a little dog can bear a bone. If I leave you, how long? Somebody tell me how long, how long, how long? Somebody tell me how long, how long? Please tell me how long, how long, how long? If you confuse. I'm talking about my 40 acres and my mule. Granddaddy died waiting. Grandmama died waiting too. Martin Luther King died waiting, y'all. Tell me what about, what about me and you? Now if you're still confused I'm talking about my father eagles and my mule. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I I got to tell you this since I got two minutes to tell you about my daddy. He taught me to look like this. I had a song said. Daddy told me on a dying bed Give up your heart but don't lose your head You came along, what did I do? Lost my heart and my head too Lord have mercy Little girl, little girl, you shook and cook Little girl, little girl, I like the way you look. When you cook that chicken, save me the head. Should be working when I'm home in bed. Thinking about you. Dreaming about you. Love that girl. 
But I love them chicken heads too. <laughs> Without your love, girl, I just can't go on. Feeling I have for you, girl, is much too strong. Let me in, let me in, let me in, let me ease on in. That's another thing, baby. Chicken in the car, and the car won't go. That's the way you spell Chicago. <laughs> a knife and a fork, and a plate of green. That's the way you spell New Orleans. <laughs> See the girl sitting there with the white dress on. Turn her loose, brother. <laughs> Let her turn Barbara Rush on. <laughs> Me and that woman go hand in hand. She's a bow legged woman. I'm a not need man. <laughs> when you put us together, we spell O X Ox. Easy to get to. Now, I wrote all these songs that I'm writing here that I that I written a long time ago. That part about the bow legged and, and easy to get to, that wasn't in my song then. I just put that in another day. <laughs> it just let <laughs> me Oh man. Oh man. Y'all y'all so can, y'all so can. We are, we are, we're going to, uh, they can pick the uh, book over there. If, if you didn't get the book, pick it up and take it home with you and read it and tell mm -hmm. others about it. And I'm hoping that you go away saying to yourself, if Bobby Rich can make it out of all the trenches he's been through and been in, I know I can make it. And I'm not, I didn't, I'm not talking about it was so hard for me, I was the only man that went through this high waters and what have you. I know this other had situations even worse than I had. But I just want to share with you that no matter what you're going through or what you went through, what you've been through, what you're going through at this moment, it's not, just, it's not the end of the rainbow. You can make it. You can make it if you try. We may have time for one or two quick questions, if anybody's got one. We'll let these get asked, and then we'll head over and buy some books. Bobby, <clears throat> would you tell them about one of the first times you heard the blues when your daddy set you down and told <laughs> you about that chinker pen? <laughs> yeah, I'll I tell you what. I don't know why I got time. To... This is where this lick come from, like this. My daddy been a preacher. Came from the cotton field one day picking cotton. I, my cousin had gave me a guitar and I put it in a loft, a bun. And the sun got to the neck and whopped the old neck and I would take it and put it in water. Horse trough where the cows drank water. And it was straightened back out. My daddy told me this one day, he said, Bobby Rush. He said, hey son. I didn't hear him call me, call me again. Hey Junior. Come here, man. I came there. He said, bring that guitar here. I didn't know you know I had a guitar. Because I thought he was going to take it from me or whip me back for having it. Because I thought maybe he wanted me to play church, you know, gospel stuff. And I didn't want no part of gospel stuff. I wanted to play the blues, man. You know? So when I brought it to him, he's, he's tuning it up like this. I said, wow, my daddy could play? And he started, he said, boy, let me play a guitar. Let me play this guitar for you and sing a song I used to sing for a little girl when I was a little older than you. What I wanted to hear because I thought it was going to be glory, glory, hallelujah, when I laid my burden down. I thought, I either about my mama, but he started to sing it like this. He said, me and my girl went to Chanky Pen hunting. She fell down and I saw something. I said, daddy. I preacher now, you know, my dad, my dad is a preacher. I said, Dad, sing it again. Now, what I wanted him to do is sing the other verse. Because I figured now he don't, she fell down. He saw something, right? I figured the next verse would tell me what he saw. I said, Dad, sing it again. My mama's in the cooking. cooking. She said, <clears throat> I mean, don't sing that song, song that boy. 
She went here with the sand again. He said, me and my girl went to Chanky Pen hunting. She fell down and I saw something. I stared it. Sang it again. Now what I want him to do is say the next verse. And I look around. My mama looked around. And she said, <clears throat> he went to sing it again. My mama. I said, daddy, daddy, how big was she? He said, oh, 350 pounds, boy, about, like, about that wide. 350 pounds. I said, what's she had on, Dad? He's nothing but a dress in my little mind. Fat lady falling down with nothing on but a dress. Oh, man, I had I could see it right now. I could see it. It's in my mind. I said, sing it again. By that time, my mother walking up close to her. He said, me and my dad was a chinky bit, honey. She fell down, and I kept running. <laughs> <laughs> my, my mama broke it up. I don't know. I don't know what he would have told me, you know. But my, but I knew right then I want to be a blues singer. I want to be a blues singer, you know. Yeah, you know. I, I, I was. It remind me that how the steel was on, how the steel been on. Black men been playing the blues all their life, and if it wasn't for some of the white guys who played the blues, I don't know what the blues would be because some of the black guys who played the blues is shame of the blues, ashamed of themselves playing the blues. You know, myself, and, uh, I remember when they invented a wah wah so the white guy could sound like the black guys. Now you got black guys buying all the wah wah trying to sound like a white guy who's trying to sound black. <laughs> you know, but, uh, but I said all that to let you know how the steel was on, you know. Y'all probably know that, did you? It's been what Jimmy Reed was saying. Y'all remember that? Oh, baby, you don't have to go until the Beatles come to town. They stole it and said, "Come together." Y'all didn't know that, did you? But, but before I leave you, here's something they couldn't steal. My woman just like a dresser. Somebody always rambling in the drawers. My woman just like a dresser. Somebody always, always rambling in the drawers. Or oh, get to the place here lately. I can't put no trust in my woman at all. <laughs> Thank you all for coming today. Uh, we have copies of I Ain't Studying You. I promise it is almost as much fun as this has been. we we'll buy copies of it over here. They're already signed, but Mr. Rush will be over at this table if you want him to personalize it. Uh, join us next week for History is Lunch. And uh, help me, though, today thank Brenda Willis and Bobby Rush for this fabulous program.